and we'll move directly into the committee of the whole meeting chaired by uh, Mary Alice Wu as soon as um, the clerk gives the signal. Phyllis, are you ready? Yes. All right, so I'd like to call this committee of the whole meeting uh, to order. Would the clerk please call the roll? Ms. Wu? Here. Mr. Evans? Here. Ms. Hersey? Here. Ms. Colasetti? Here. Ms. Bishop? Here. Ms. Wilkins? Here. Mr. Quisenberry? Here. Mayor Marlin? Here. Thank you. All right, the first item on our agenda is approval of the minutes from previous meetings from April 19, 2021. Can I have a motion? I'll move to approve those minutes. I'll second. Moved by Chandra and, sorry, moved by Sharice and seconded by Chandra. Are there any corrections? All right, will the clerk please call the roll? Ms. Wu? Yes. Mr. Evans? Yes. Ms. Hersey? Yes. Ms. Colasetti? Yes. Uh, oh, Ms. Bishop? Yes. Ms. Wilkins? Yes. Mr. Quisenberry? Yes. Sorry for the delay in your names, guys. I'll learn who you are. <laughs> uh, next up is additions to the agenda. I believe the mayor has a proclamation. Uh, Diane, is, is that correct? You're muted. Yes, I have a proclamation for municipal clerks weeks that I'd and like to add. Like to put I'd like to put that after the presentation on enterprise zones and subdivisions. Okay. So that would be item number 12. All right. No, it would, be, it would be under item number four. Oh, sorry. Item number. Um, can I make a statement a little uh, bit? Uh, when, you're, when you're doing proclamations, they actually do not need to be added to the agenda or even voted on because they're just things that you are presenting outside of whatever it is that the council needs to do. Oh. All right. Any other additions to the agenda? All right. Well, we will start with a council member training session for the enterprise zones and subdivisions. Is uh, who's presenting on that tonight? Stephanie, are you presenting on that? I am. I am. Go for it. I'm going to share uh, share my screen with y'all. Um, I just wanted to do a. Hang on one second. Uh, let's see. There we go. Okay. Um, tonight, we just wanted to sh share some information about Enterprise Zone with you because we'll be um, bringing some uh, development agreements to you in the future. And so um, we'll just get started. This will just take a few minutes. Um, an Enterprise Zone is a design defined geographic area created to stimulate business retention and growth as well as neighborhood revitalization in depressed areas. Enterprise zones are designated by the state, but managed locally. I, uh, Steph McMahon, am the administrator for the City of Urbana Enterprise Zone. Historically, the focus of enterprise zones was industrial growth, but the program also allows for commercial and residential development. There are approximately 100 zones in Illinois and applications to create new zones are competitive. The life of an enterprise zone is 15 years. Manages enterprise zone incentives, such as investment tax credits, sales tax exemption on manufacturing machinery and equipment, and also utility tax exemptions. The local jurisdictions, that means us, we manage two incentives, including sales tax exemption on building materials, and property tax abatement for qualifying projects built within an enterprise zone. The city of Urbana's enterprise zone was designated on January 1, 2016, which means it will expire at the end of 2031. 
Urbana's Enterprise Zone incentivizes projects for new and remodeled industrial and commercial projects and for new residential projects, which is our Think Urbana program where we market and encourage people to build new homes in Urbana. This slideshow shows a copy of our Enterprise Zone map, which is also uh, available on our city website and is an overlay on the county's GIS website. So if you look up an address on that county GIS site, you can click on our Enterprise Zone and see if the property falls within the zone. The taxing bodies that participate in property tax abatement along with the city include the county, the school district, the park district, the township, MTD, and Parkland, though Parkland does not participate in the residential abatements. For a project to be eligible for Enterprise Zone incentives, it must be at least $80,000 and requires a building permit. Residential projects uh, are a little different than commercial and they have to be new, uh, new construction. By the end of last year, our Enterprise Zone had helped 107 projects at the investment of $116.5 million. And this added 17 and a half million to our equalized assessed value of our tax base and created or retained 475 jobs, 500 new residential units, and 94 new single family and duplex homes. The Enterprise Zone is a tool the city will use to support new development and grow our community. Uh, so I kind of made it pretty simple there, but I'm always glad and available to answer any questions you guys have about the Enterprise Zone. All right, are there any questions for Steph? I'm gonna scroll through. Uh, Grace? Uh, thank you. I was wondering if there are any incentives for um, remodeling existing homes or building on brownfields, or if this is exclusively for new development, and if that's kind of the, uh, or the national goal with this. Our zone uh, incentives are for new construction. Our grants department may have programs that come available through HUD and HOME that Sheila Dodd would administer that might help with home renovation. She will probably be telling you more about that in the future. And are they- and the, and the Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, I'm sorry. I was just gonna say, and the Enterprise then, Zone then has incentives that help with businesses to remodel or build new that um, include that property tax abatement and sales tax exemption on building materials. And is there any kind of encouragement for um, like green building design and efficiency with that? Or is it just up to the standard codes? Up to the standard codes for Urbana. Yeah. All right, any other questions for Steph? Scrolling through to make sure I'm not missing anyone. Okay, thank you so much. The next item on the agenda is a proclamation from the mayor. Actually, we have another um, presentation, a quick training from Kevin oh. on subdivisions. Okay, you guys merged right. those two. <laughs> gotcha. So I'll try and I'll try and keep it brief enough that you stay awake during it. Um, okay. Uh, so subdivisions. Um, real quickly, I just want to talk about some basics with subdivisions. Um, go through differences between minor and uh, major developments, and then preliminary and final plats. And then I'm going to touch on what's called our extraterritorial jurisdiction. Um, so just to jump right into it, um, subdivisions, uh, when we talk about subdivisions, uh, well, first of all, I should introduce myself. Uh, I'm, I'm Kevin Garcia. I'm the principal planner. Um, so I supervise the, the planning division. So we deal with, uh, with land use, with zoning, um, and things of that nature. So welcome to all new council members. Um, so when we talk about subdivisions and planning, uh, we're not talking about specific named subdivisions per se. Um, we're really talking about the process of splitting larger pieces of land into smaller pieces of land. So subdividing the land. Um, and usually that's because the owner wants to develop the land um, in a specific way in, in relatively short order. Um, so typically what we'll see in Urbana, which we, we haven't been seeing many subdivisions um, for, for quite some time, um, but typically what we'll see is 
might see a large piece of farmland that somebody wants to uh, split into smaller uh, residential or commercial lots. Um, there occasionally will get a larger tract that's already sort of within the established town um, that somebody just wants to wants to cut into smaller pieces to develop. Um, occasionally, which is something that council doesn't see because it's it's too small of a of a type of subdivision, but we might get some duplexes that people want to um, sort of split into two lots um, and create sort of ownership of each half of, of a duplex. Um, so minor subdivisions are things that council won't see, but just for, for your benefit and education, uh, I just wanted to bring them up. So that's when somebody wants to split land into five lots or less, um, and the land also already has to have things like streets, water, uh, electricity, sewers. Um, and those minor subdivisions are an administrative process. So we handle that on the staff level. We have to send those out for review from a multitude of agencies and utilities um, and get their, get their feedback before um, that gets approved. Then a major subdivision is um, actually by definition, everything that's not a minor uh, subdivision. So that's an easy, an easy definition. Um, then within, within subdivisions, we have what are called preliminary and final subdivisions or preliminary and final plats, we'll call them. Um, preliminary council will not see those. Those are reviewed by plan commission um, with the exception that if there is a waiver that is requested, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, if there is a waiver, then council will see the waiver um, that's requested. Um, I can pull up, let me share my screen. I'll just pull up an example um, of, a, of a preliminary subdivision. Um, so preliminary subdivisions tend to have a lot more of the, of the bare bones, um, uh, the bare bones essentials. So, so this first page just shows an overview. So this is Behringer Commons up in the Northeast section of the city. So you see there are lots laid out, there are streets in there. Um, and then you'll get into more details with, if I can go on to further page. Yeah, lots of text <laughs> um, describing things. Um, but if you, so if you zoom in on the details, so you see they've got the streets laid out, um, they have uh, drainage. So here's a, a detention. Um, basin here, um, you'll see there are little, all of these little dots are, are manhole covers um, or other utilities. So the preliminary plat really lays out sort of the, the basic um, underpinnings of, of developing that piece of land. Um, and then, so then once the, uh, once the preliminary plat gets approved, then we move on to I can pull this up um, to the final plat. And the final plat is something that council does review. And this, um, whoops. So the final plat has less, you know, less details since all of the, you know, those big details have been laid out in the preliminary plat. Um, this, is, this one is just for a section. So this says Behringer Common subdivision number five. So a lot of times developers will uh, we'll do the preliminary plat, and then over time, as they develop land, they'll they'll do smaller chunks. So this is the fifth chunk of development for for Behringer Commons. So you see on this, what they actually do is instead of just showing where all the lots and streets are, they actually put in dimensions, um, so you can see, and they actually go out and place what are called pins in the ground. Um, so you can see that you can actually physically go out and locate the corner of every property that's been platted. Uh, some of the older properties in town are, you know, it's harder to find those, um, but that's what we have surveyors for. Um, so, yeah, so the final plat will show all the, the lots, the right, the rights of way, so the streets, um, the sidewalks um, and things. And... And then uh, I mentioned waivers earlier. So essentially uh, a developer can ask for a waiver from, from any element that's required. Sorry, I might hear my kids playing outside. Um, from any development uh, or from any regulation that's in the subdivision and land development ordinance, which governs 
subdivisions, as the name suggests. Um, but to be granted a waiver, the developer has to claim some, some sort of, uh, or they have to state some reasoning for it. They just can't say, um, I want this waiver because I, I would like it. Um, so there has to be some reasoning behind it. So they might ask for waivers of things like sidewalks, which I don't imagine we'd grant a waiver for a sidewalk um, these days, unless maybe in an industrial subdivision on the outskirts of town or something, um, or things like street width. Um, but again, they can ask for a waiver for, for any element or from any element of the subdivision ordinance. Uh, and then finally, we have what's called, we are a home rule municipality in the state of Illinois. Um, so that means we have a one and a half mile area surrounding the, the city limits that's called the extraterritorial jurisdiction. And we have subdivision um, authority over any subdivision that happens within that one and a half mile extraterritorial jurisdiction. So in your time on council, you might, um, well, yeah, I suppose if somebody, if somebody wanted to do a preliminary and then a final plat for a development that's out within a mile and a half of the city, then you would, you would see the final plat um, for that. Uh, I, I don't recall many of those happening in my time here, but it's a possibility. Um, okay, that was probably a lot, definitely a crash course, but I'd be happy to, uh, to answer any questions you have about subdivisions. Looks like Jayla. Yeah, um, I do have a quick question because I know that we have one that we're going to be talking about today where the yes. preliminary and the final are kind of smushed together. I know you said this doesn't happen very often, but I'm curious, like, is that something that happens frequently? Could you talk a little bit about that? Right. Yeah. So we do. And, and that's a great question. So we we do offer a developer the option to do what we call a combination preliminary and final. So it just saves some some time to do both of them at the same time. So if somebody in this, like in this case tonight, they are ready, you know, they're ready to go. Um, we allow them to do it all at once. So essentially that's, that's the process. So they don't have to go through plan commission. And then after they get the preliminary approved, then apply for the final plat. It's just more efficient that way. Jay, did you have any other questions? No, I just forgot to put my hand down. Thanks. Okay. Charisse. Okay. Um, Kevin, um, I wanted, I guess what I wanted to know, because like Jaya was talking about the, you know, we have this um, uh, subdivision that we'll be uh, voting on tonight. Now, are we allowing these two, um, the, the, uh, the conjugation of these two, uh, con conjunction of these two particular levels to happen because of how long ago the, uh, another city council had actually approved this uh, development or? No, no, this one tonight, um, the preliminary plat was just approved by plan commission a couple weeks ago. So this isn't, this isn't one of those cases where somebody did the preliminary plat, say 30 years ago, 20 years ago is more like it, but, uh, and then they're coming in for a final. So they were oh. ready to go with both of them at once. Are, are you going to be presenting on this again when it comes up later? I am not, but. Kat is it will... bloody? Yeah, Kat Trotter will be able to handle all of your tough questions admirably. Okay, I don't think I have any tough questions, but <laughs> okay, thanks. You're welcome. All right, any other questions for Kevin? Okay, uh, we will. Thank you very much, Kevin. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Steph. We will move on to a public input. First person up is Wayne Williams. Wayne, would you state your city of residence, please? Uh, looks like I was on mute. Hi, I'm Wayne Williams. I 
I'm just wanting to comment on the proposed liquor license for Cracker Barrel. I live in the area and um, I am opposed to the liquor license for Cracker Barrel. Cracker Barrel has been around for over 50 years and they are just now um, wanting to sell beer and wine out of their restaurants. Um, I think it's advantageous that it's a uh, family style restaurant without beer and wine. Furthermore, uh, Cracker Barrel, while they are getting better, uh, has a as a company has a history of discrimination, racial discrimination, discrimination against LGBTQ populations, and employment discrimination. Um, so I would urge you all to um, oppose the liquor license for Cracker Barrel. Thank you. Thank you for your input. The next person up is Tracy Chong. Would you play your state your city of residence? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Why do I have to state my city of residence? It's a question. You don't have to. Uh, maybe you should make it clear to the public. Well, okay. Mr. Williams didn't state his residence, so it's just a question. Can you reset my timer? Sure. Thank you. Hi, I'm Tracy Chong. Um, did any of you watch the CPRB meeting and taser review last Wednesday on April 28th? During this um, two taser reviews, Deputy Chief Self admitted to rather serious misconduct by UP UPD officers, but proceeded to make light of the use of force as and the misconduct. During the review, three out of five board members found that there was inappropriate taser usage for one case. In this case, Sergeant Hurley tased an individual who did not match the suspect's description. What happened was that they saw a black male and regardless of description, he was automatically a suspect, just like in the Aaliyah Lewis incident where they stopped the juvenile that totally did not match the suspect's description. Meanwhile, to justify this, Deputy Chief Sells told board members that the suspect's clothing, weight, and height was not specific and relative, even though from the mad cat call, it was pretty darn specific. Meanwhile, the UPD officers tased this individual who did not even match the suspect's description from the back as he was running. The UPD taser policy states that mere flight is not a good cause for tasering an individual. There are so many reasons why a person might want to avoid the police, as mentioned by a board member, like fear, especially for a person of color. This is where de-escalation techniques should have been applied, but it was not even discussed. In this case, the taser usage form listed the reason for tasering as violent suspect and fighting suspect with gun. From the review, this could not be further from the truth. We should really start looking closer at the integrity of police reports and use of force reports, especially since the past council had placed quite a bit of weight on the use of force reviews and making a use of force review committee. But please keep in mind that if the reports themselves are dishonest, the review is already biased. Also, this is not a one-off incident. In the second taser case, multiple UPD officers wrote that the taste individual shoved an officer um, as the reason why he was tased. However, the video showed that it was actually a UPD officer who reaches his hand out to push or stop the individual and that causes the individual to swat the officer's hand off. And within one second, he was tased without any warning. In this case, there was no reason to think that this person was armed. It was a domestic violence call. The taser reports also did not address Only why no warning was given this is misconduct both in the tasering and also in the following report as UPD taser policy states that a verbal warning of the intended use of the taser should precede its application and that reasons it was not given shall be documented by the officer discharging the taser. Unfortunately, City Administrator Carol Mitten prohibited board members from voting on this review because it had been reviewed before. However, this does not seem right because only one minute of footage was provided in the initial review and Deputy Chief Sells lied about not knowing if additional footage was available. Even though it was so clear from three police reports that squad cam video had been put into evidence. When he produced the video 10 months later after the residents brought up this issue over and over again, um, this is where we see the misconduct and excessive use of force. Finally, one of the biggest concern was that an officer was running around with a taser and gun, one in each hand in the midst of residence. Um, Searles acknowledged that this was wrong, but it was rather alarming to hear him trivialize it. 
saying something like, oh, I, I'm not happy about it. Even worse, after board members voted that there was indeed inappropriate use of the taser, Sills tried to make the issue into how the taser policy should be changed. The policy is correct. The policy finds the officers wrong. Um, what should change is UPD's officers' misconduct and how they should be held accountable. Can we talk about how we can fix this problem? Thank you. Thank you for your input. The next person is Sarah Nixon. Can you state your city of residence? Hello, city council. This is Sarah Nixon. Um, first of all, I would like to um, thank Ms. Tracy Chong for the comments she just made. Um, she touched again, once again, she touched on so many important issues and I urge the city council not to allow her input to continue to be ignored and um, work with her and other city watchdogs who are bringing to your attention valuable information, data and issues. I would also like to thank Ms. Chong for questioning why uh, the meeting chairs requiring um, members of the public to state their city of residence. Um, I recall at a recent city council meeting, and I think it was last week, Alderman Miller asking Alderwoman Wu why she was doing this, why she was asking the public to state their, their um, city or place of residence. And Miss Wu, you uh, responded and admitted that this is not required and disingenuously are denying or did last week denied that you were uh, asking people to, to, to state their place of residence. And yet here you are doing it again this evening. Um, when it comes, and, and, and I believe we just heard you, you respond to Ms. Chong with the statement that no, you're, you're just merely suggesting it, but you're not. Um, you know, grammar works in the following way. When you phrase or word, a statement or a question with, will you, you know, beginning with, will you do this? That's actually not, um, there's no expectation that the person whom you're addressing will actually say no. So although it may look like a typical question, it isn't. In fact, it's, it's a directive. And as Mr. Miller pointed out, you should actually be advising the public that they, they are not required to um, provide that, that information. I'd like, uh, myself, I would like to um, bring to your attention and, and to the, the council that there are members of the public who need to keep their place of residence confidential. Uh, there are members who come forward to provide input who are survivors of domestic violence. There are people for whom stalking is a reality. Uh, there are, in fact, some people who give you public input who are homeless and they don't have a place of residence to state. And I think it's, it's unnecessary and inappropriate to emphasize that you, were, you wrongly are asking them to do this and requiring this. Um, you risk, uh, imposing the stigma that comes along with those issues that I've just highlighted for you. Um, I wouldn't want to see you making uh, members of the public feel intimidated or, or ashamed of their status. Um, just, and th those are just a few examples uh, as, as to why it's inappropriate uh, for you to be asking this. Um, I would like to close also by mentioning that last week at last week's city council, I had my hand up and I was passed over. Uh, for comment. Um, and I understand that I'm not the only person uh, in that situation. So I would ask you to please pay attention and be very careful, have a careful look at who, at whether any hands are up before you move on to other uh, agenda business. Thank you. All right, the next person up is Christopher Hansen. Can you please state your city of residence? All right, you okay? <laughs> yes. Hi. Well, it's uh, nice to see all these new faces. Um, that's really exciting. So uh, 
welcome. Um, it is a little unfortunate to see Miss Wu exhibiting uh, an interesting level of stubbornness. Um, I'm pretty familiar with the open meeting set. Um, and there is no authority provided by the state to require or ask anyone about their city of, or state of re residence. Someone could call from Argentina and you have to allow them to speak. It says any person can speak. So I don't know why you're doing this. I mean, it only serves to intimidate people. So I suggest you knock it off. Um, you've had multiple determinations of Open, Meeting Act, Open Meetings Act violations from the Illinois Attorney General. You're admitting defeat in Open Meetings Act lawsuit now. Miss Wu, you're being investigated by the IAG for Open Meetings Act violations regarding public input at the electoral board meetings uh, hearings last year. So I don't quite understand what you think you're doing, but stop it. Uh, any of you who, who are sitting on the council, anyone else can call a point of order anytime you want and bring the issue up right now and say, why are we asking people or requiring people to state their residence? Any one of you can do that if you think that's inappropriate. So um, on to some other content, I, I strongly urge you to listen to what uh, Tracy Chong said about going back and looking at the, uh, CP, the recent CPRB meeting uh, in case it wasn't clear what, they, what, what incident she was describing there. They did a taser review uh, of a taser discharge. And <laughs> what, what happened in this situation was pretty simply was uh, a, the police were called in regards to someone having a gun, not, not using it or anything. It was in their hand or something like that. The Urbana police stopped someone who did not match the description in terms of height or weight or clothing color, including their shirt and pants. None of it matched. The only thing that matched was that they were black. They stopped this person in an apartment building. He wanted nothing to do with it. So he turned and tried to run. One of our the officers shot him in the back with a taser gun and it failed. And so that officer continued to chase him, had his taser gun in one hand, pulled his service pistol with the other hand and continued to run across a parking lot with one gun in each hand, like a maniac. He actually ran past a, a mother pushing a stroller while doing this. Uh, that, that was the, those are the basic details of that incident. I, I strongly urge you to go look at that review um, and ask why, uh, actually two of the CPRB members said, said that this was proper taser usage. Even after our deputy chief even admitted that, you know, running with two guns in your hands is, is a policy violation. It's right there in the policy. Uh, so I thought that was really interesting and it kind of shows us that, you know, we're, we're still failing at, at least in, at an institutional level within the Urbana Police Department to recognize misconduct. And it just shows how impossible it is for the police to recognize mis misconduct when they review themselves. Uh, I also think this count council should look into the fact that uh, Officer James Corey Coker has now been put in charge of uh, reviewing police complaints uh, with the CPRB. Um, this is the same officer that was involved in the Alea Lewis arrest. Uh, he was the most senior officer involved. Um, he saw nothing wrong with that situation. He was the one who was yelling at Alea Lewis, telling her to act like a lady uh, and all of that. So I I'm not sure if this is the person that the public would like to see placed in charge of reviewing police complaints. I'm not sure that encourages public trust in that process. I'm not sure there's any trust in that process to begin with, but it sure isn't getting any better if the officers whom we think are not acting appropriately are then put in charge of reviewing complaints against the Urbana Police Department. So once again, please, please, please go back and watch, watch that CPRB meeting that just happened. At least watch the, the taser review portion of it. Uh, and I think you'll uh, start to see what the rest of us are seeing. Thank you, good night. All right, if anybody else wishes to address the Committee of the Whole, please raise your hand at this time. All right, I don't see any other hands raised. Uh, Diane, I'm sorry, you needed to do the proclamation after the presentation, but you can do the, pres uh, the proclamation now before we move on to the item other items. Thanks, Mary Alice. So uh, this is a proclamation. Whereas the office of the municipal clerk, a time honored and vital part of local government exists throughout the world and is the oldest among public servants, and whereas the office of the municipal clerk provides the professional link between the citizens, the local governing bodies and agencies of government at other levels. And whereas municipal clerks have pledged to be ever mindful of their neutrality and impartiality, rendering, rendering equal service to all. And whereas the municipal clerk serves as the information center on functions of local government and community. 
And whereas municipal clerks continually strive to improve the administration of the affairs of the Office of the Municipal Clerk through participation in education programs, seminars, workshops, and the annual meetings of their state, provincial, county, and international professional organizations. And whereas it's appropriate that we recognize the accomplishments of the Office of the Municipal Clerk. Now, therefore I, Diane Wolf Marlin, Mayor of the City of Urbana, do hereby proclaim May 2nd through May 8th, 2021 as Municipal Clerks Week in the City of Urbana, Illinois. And we thank our local city clerk, Phyllis Clark and her staff and deputy clerk, Wendy Hundley and their uh, assistant, Kay Mihari. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next item is staff report. Do we have any staff reports tonight? I do not see any staff. Report. I have a, I have I Diane. Want to a couple of items to report. One is that we were notified last week from Congressman Ronnie Davis's office that four local projects were included in the member designated project requests by the Congressman. That's otherwise known as earmarks. One of those projects was in the city of Urbana. So uh, we, he is requesting $1.7 million for um, repair of Springfield Avenue and Lincoln Avenue in Urbana. This is one of the streets in the worst conditions in our community, serves as the gateway to the community. And we're very grateful that that was included in the earmarks. This frees up capital funds to be used elsewhere in the city. So we're grateful for the $1.7 million. Also on that list was $9.8 million to the Champaign-Urbana Mass Transit District to buy hydrogen fuel cell buses, hybrid buses. $1 million to Willard Airport for improvements in their security screening area. And $3.3 million to Savoy to help uh, fund the Curtis Road grade separation between the railroad and the street. All four of these projects have direct benefits to our city, city of Urbana, plus the region as a whole. So we're grateful for these projects to be included in the earmarks. Um, and I also wanted to let you know that Urbana Public Television has won two regional media awards at the Best of the Midwest Media Fest. This fest recognizes the best community access television programs in the Midwest. So for the city of Urbana, Nathan DeHaan, Alex Aguilera, Brandon Jones, and Jake Hassan received a merit award in the entertainment category for media produced by college students for their program, Illini Drive. And then Elizabeth Hess and CU PhD director Julie Pride received the Significant Community Program Award for their weekly interview series on the COVID-19 pandemic in the community. Uh, you probably have seen this program. This occurs every week since the pandemic started and it's a, just a wonderful source of information for the public. Jason Liggett served as the production coordinator for both of these um, programs. So we thank him, we thank his staff, we thank members of the community who continue to provide outstanding um, public programming for our community. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Any other staff reports? No, all right. Next up are all of our resolutions and ordinance. So resolution number 2021-0502-R, 020R, a resolution accepting a grant for the Community Foundation of East Central Illinois for tree planting, public works. Who is gonna be presenting on that? Scott is. Good evening, welcome Please. to new counselors. Uh, my name is Scott Tess, I'm the sustainability and resilience officer for the city of Urbana. The city has received an incredibly generous donation from an Urbana resident. And that uh, donation is for expanding street tree planting in the city's right of ways. This resolution will allow the city to accept that donation through the Community Foundation of East Central Illinois. Uh, also on the call is city arborist, Kevin Sanderson. And the two of us are happy to take any questions you may have. All right, questions for staff. Grace? Uh, thank you. I was wondering if um, it would be possible slash in the plan to include any um, food producing trees like fruit and nut trees in this project? 
I'll leave that to Kevin. Uh, he, he'll be selecting the tree species. And Kevin, since you're joining us, sorry about that. Kevin, since you're joining us uh, via phone, just be sure to press star six to unmute. Star six, and then you should be unmuted to address the council. Can you hear me now? Yep, we can, can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, to answer that, Grace, so we try to refrain from uh, planting fruit trees in the right away for just because of the litter and um, uh, the litter on the sidewalks can become a trip hazard if, if it's a uh, big fruit producing tree. Yes. Are they all on the right of way or are there any you know, larger spaces, corner spaces, anywhere that could um, accommodate? Uh, mostly to be within the right of way and our right of ways are, you know, eight to 12 foot maximum width. So we're, we're pretty limited to uh, fruit bearing trees in the, in them areas. All right, other questions. I had a couple of questions. Um, I, it's a really exciting grant uh, to be replacing 5% of the trees. Um, that we need to be planting. Uh, the website that you put up, uh, urbana.mytreekeeper.com, unless I mistyped it multiple times, I don't think it's live. So I'm wondering if perhaps before the next city council meeting, if that could be looked into. That, I'll take a look. Okay, great. We've been using it, yeah. My second question had to do with um, you have a map here. I'm wondering if you have a if you have the ability to share that map with everybody. Sure, I can screen share that from the agenda or from the from the back end. One moment. So in that map of the areas uh, in red are the areas that we're going to be looking to plant these trees. Is that right? Red and blue. So what's the difference between the red and the blue? So the blue is the community development target area that is established by community development, Urbana Community Development. And uh, those are areas where they're taking raw census data and adding what we know about our community locally in terms of uh, low income. So it's an attempt to make more accurate low income designated census zones. The red is established by the state of Illinois it, it, through a process created in the uh, uh, Future Energy Jobs Act. And it's part of the, uh, the um, low income and, and environmental justice programming as part of um, the Illinois Solar for All program, which is part of the state Future Energy Jobs Act. So they're, they're similar, they're related, but um, you know, we're looking at both of these knowing that you know, when you're slicing and dicing data, it's difficult to, um, it's difficult to render what you're, what you're going after perfectly. So uh, I guess, I know that we have talked about equity within the city in terms of um, resources, city services and so forth. Has there been any assessment in these areas in the red and the blue areas in terms of um, equitable tree disbursement, I would call it. Yeah, we, we actually received a grant from uh, from the Lumpkin Family Foundation, and we're uh, working with a vendor right now who's doing some analysis on our street tree distribution and our vacant tree site distribution with respect to uh, the, the environmental justice zones and the community development target area zones. Okay, we don't have those right. results in yet. Thank you. And I believe this is for three years. Is that three years out? This, uh, this, this grant for tree planting, we're, uh, we're implementing over the course of three years, correct? Any other questions for staff? And uh, I just want to show you real quick. This is the website, but it looks. Like... Oh. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was having problems loading earlier. I'll double yeah, check. Yes, a little bit of a problem there too, but this is what it looks like generally. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, at this time, I'll entertain a motion to, uh, for the recommendation on where to send this to city council. So the motion would be uh, to move 
the item and you'd have to read the resolution number to city council with a recommendation for approval, uh, a recommendation for no approval, um, or uh, it could also die, so. I'd like to move that resolution number 2021-05-020R, a resolution accepting a grant from the Community Foundation of East Central Illinois for tree planting be moved to uh, be approved by the city council under a consent agenda if possible. All right, a second? A second. All right, moved by Cherie, seconded by Jaya. Is there any discussion? All right, Cherise. Oh, just one thing I wanted to say, what I noticed on the map too, is that several of those trees are designated for my ward and I really appreciate that. All right, would the clerk please call the roll? Ms. Wu? Yes. Mr. Evans? Ms. Hersey? Yes. Ms. Colasetti? Yes. Ms. Bishop? Yes. Ms. Wilkins? Yes. Mr. Quisenberry? Yes. All right, that motion passes. Um, resolution number 2021-05021R, resolution approving an intergovernmental agreement for animal impoundment services from the executive office. Carol? Are you presenting on this? I am, and I'm joined by um, Lieutenant Matt Bain in the event that you have specific questions about this. But this is a this is an intergovernmental agreement with the county for them to provide animal impoundment services for the city, and they had actually asked us to sign this some time ago, and it just got lost in the shuffle. But the um, I provided you both the the um, proposed. Um, updated intergovernmental agreement as well as the last one in case you wanted to in case you wanted to see um, any of the changes but I've highlighted the the um, the most significant changes in the memo to you all and um, those changes were uh, occasioned by um, a, a huge influx of animals at one time from um, Champaign where they had uh, they, they had seized a bunch of animals after um, after from a hoarder and that that was that caused this what they're calling an extraordinary extraordinary event which put a lot of stress on them um and so they they wanted to build in some safeguards into the iga for um any future such um occurrences so um so that's th those are the main changes to the to the iga um i would say that we have um, a good relationship with the uh, folks from the county who provide this service for us, as I mentioned in the memo, we provide, unlike other jurisdictions in, in the county, we have our own animal warden or animal control officer. So um, this is an essential service for us um, because we need a place to take the animals. And um, looking forward to um, getting this finalized. And um, like I said, Lieutenant Bain is here if you have any specific questions. All right, questions for staff, Sharice. Hi, um, Matt. This, <laughs> I was wondering when I was reading this, is this just regarding like um, animals that are found like dogs or cats that are that seem to be feral running in packs or something like that? Or does it also include, for example, last year we had a possum in our garage and I had to call animal control and get the possum out. Uh, <laughs> Does it include like, you know, wildlife animals and you just put them someplace before you take them out to the woods or whatever? No, this would just be for domestic animals. Okay. Jaya? I have a, a question and a comment. Um, the comment's really simple, just that there's a, a typo on the top of page four. It says maybe instead of may be. Um, so there's just one, one little thing. But then the, my, my question is, I noticed between the two versions, the definition of veterinary services changed. Um, so the older version specifically includes spays and neuters, and the new version doesn't. And I just wanted clarification on that to make sure that it's not going to end up with the city now paying for the cost of spays and neuters if it wasn't previously, because most animals that go to the 
uh, shelter would end up being spayed or neutered. And that's on uh, page one for both versions. Do you know the answer to that, Matt? Because if not, we can get the answer. Uh, I, I, the don't, committee and I don't think that we have at least I don't think that we have ever been charged for that service, um, but I, I can I can double check. Yeah, I just am curious why it was changed, why it was taken out of the newer version, just to make sure I, that it was consistent. I don't know, and I didn't notice that, so um, I'll look into it. I'll get you Thank an you. answer. We can get you the answer to that before you vote. Uh, take a final vote next week. Thank you. All right, other questions for staff? Okay, I had a couple of questions. Um, my first question is, I know you just said, Matt, that this is only for domestic animals, and I know it specifically says it uh, does not pertain to exotic or dangerous animals. So what is what does the city do if there are exotic or dangerous animals? So we had an incident um, like that about two years ago where there were several, um, it was another hoarding situation, and they had several exotic birds and county animal control is not equipped to um, to house and care for animals such as that. Um, I, I would I would also assume things like snakes and um, maybe some some uh, uh, amphibious creatures. I don't. They're just not equipped for that. So we go to an outside agency. Um, there was actually an exotic bird rescue. I can't remember exactly where it was, but it was about 45 minutes away that that's where the animals were brought for the time being. Okay. So right. anything, anything that county can't house, um, they just don't have the means or the setup for, there's, there's all kinds of rescues and Amy Anderson, our, our um, animal control officer is very, very in tune with with those and aware of those and so that's what that's what we generally do it doesn't happen very much but that's generally what we go to okay all right my my second question had to do with uh the extraordinary event I was looking at this and i couldn't can you direct me to where that is in this agreement It's on, Marie, do you it's know on, where it is? It's on page three under okay. section four. Under equipment. Yeah. Oh, it's under equipment. Yeah. It says the county shall maintain separate Thank cages you. for animals and different species. And it discusses, kind of discusses, um, for example, if, if there were, um, if there are more than so many animals and they aren't, aren't capable of housing them. I wouldn't expect that to be under equipment, but thank you for showing that to me. I appreciate that. Take the role for me. I, I, I'm sorry. Oh, Phyllis is asking a question. Um, and then my uh, third question is, so we pay the county 88 cents per capita. So what do we, for, for this service, what is that total amount? No, the, this agreement here is is not what we pay annually to have their service. There's actually two agreements. So okay. This this one is just the three main things that were um, highlighted in the um, memo are the are what's being changed here. That per capita is a, a different contract. Okay. All right. Thank you, Grace. is I was wondering about the part of the city's responsibility to house excess animals and what the plan is for that. Do you mean in the event of an extraordinary event? Yes. Then what is the city's plan for housing those animals? So county will house them. They just want to be notified beforehand instead. The event that happened, what the, the event that happened that led up to this change was officers 
are just showing up and they were not prepared. Um, they will be, it will be on them to do, um, but they just are asking for advance notice and we don't just show up with 80 dogs from the a hoarder's house or something. They might have to reach out to the Humane Society or other rescues or, or some other kind of places, depending on the number, which again are very, very rare, but that was, um, that's my understanding. The second point there says that it's the city's responsibility to find housing for animals in excess of the county's capacity associated with that extraordinary. So I, I, I suppose we'll have to, we'll have, hopefully we'll never have a, a case where we're bringing 80 dogs in. Um, again, Amy is um, our animal control officer. She's very in tune with local rescues, um, local places to house, to house things. So if it, if it became an incident where we would go above what county is capable of doing, we would look to these outside agencies and rescues and things like that. I would love to see that, you know, item. I know it could change, but maybe at least have some kind of uh, agreement beforehand with the Humane Society or whatever those rescues might be, just so that there is a plan if that happens, because um, the chances are it won't be expected when it does happen. Yeah, it's very possible. Sometimes we do know about it and have an idea um, of the number of animals and those arrangements can be made ahead of time. Um, I'm not sure the exact number of um, animals that the county can hold. So I don't know what, you know, if we get over uh, 30 or 40, I, I could find that out too. Um, yes, we have to let them know if we're bringing in more than three, but what is their max? And I can find that out too. I think if I could just interject, I think there's sort of a dynamic quality to this too, which is the, 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 the population fluctuates, right? And, and that's true of any shelter, that's true of the county um, empowerment and so forth. And I think if we actually had a situation like this, we would be collaborating on where to put the animals. Yes, definitely. I would just love to see at least some kind of tentative plan that the Humane Society or some rescues are willing to help with this overflow if the city is going to take that on. All right, Jay, you had your hand up earlier. Did you mean to put it down? I, I was just going to raise the same point that Grace okay. did, that it specifically does say that the city is responsible. And I would echo that I would like to see a plan in place for what would happen in a case like that. All right, James, you're muted. Noticed in the background, um, and I remember this from my time on the county board, that um, Urbana is the only uh, jurisdiction that has their own um, animal control warden. and. Uh, I'm guessing, but I would like you to clarify this, that that's because the cost at which the county would charge for that service, we do it ourselves at a, at a lower rate. You want me to take, I'll, I'll take it first, Matt, and then you can, you can clean up anything that I, I don't get right. So we, we talked about this a couple of times, or I talked about this a couple of times with the, with the chief. And I think what it is, it's, it's, it's a combination of we, if we hire somebody as our animal control officer, we use that person for more than just animal control. So we get more out of that. Um, I think uh, every five years or so on, on average, we, we take a look at the numbers again and see if that still makes sense for us. Um, and, and so that's something that we may be looking at again, you know, um, who knows, but um, for now, uh, you know, we, uh, I, think, I think Amy Anderson also does um, orange hat patrol as she co coordinates that. I know she helps with evidence um, from time to time and there, and there may be other things that she does in terms of community outreach. Um, Lieutenant Bing probably knows that, but, but it's, it's not a straight one for one because it's not a, it's not a full-time animal control function. Yeah, that's right. She does a lot of other um, duties within the police department, especially in the administrative part. She goes into schools and does presentations for kids with animal safety and bike safety. Um, she is the backup uh, fingerprinting person at the police department. Um, she does help with evidence. Um, she is involved with neighborhood watches. So she does, she does a variety of things other than just animal control, so. Thanks. All right, Grace. 
Thank you. Um, I had other questions about the euthanasia with the order of destruction on page four. Um, and just seems like I can't pinpoint what it was, but I know there's been some issues locally with um, kind of premature euthanasia of someone's pet before it was picked up. And um, just kind of wondering how that works and how it's the court or city legal division that's the one to make that decision. Um, yeah, just kind of curious how that works. Matt, you so, want me to go first and then you can okay. clean up? Okay. Um, so the decision about, there's a, there's a point at which the animal is no longer the property of the city and the animal becomes property of the county. And they may, and, and this, I will turn to Matt to explain because he knows it in much greater detail. They go through a protocol to determine whether the animal is adoptable. And then they, um, they decide whether it needs to be euthanized. And so now Matt, if you would just kind of just hit the highlights of what that protocol looks like. Sure, so I actually recently went out to um, County Animal Control and spoke with the director, Stephanie Jose, and she explained her process, um, of essentially an evaluation on whether they are going to recommend an animal that has been turned over to them for adoption or if it is going to need to be put down. Um, she uh, documented, it. we did speak a little bit about the, um, the latest incident um, that happened in December over there where the mistake was made. Um, I believe that it was an isolated event. Um, some corrections have been made and things have been changed. Um, so I am satisfied with what I saw as to their process and um, record keeping of such. Who um, makes that decision about a pet being adoptable or not? That's at the county um, facility? Yes. The county makes the decision. The county makes the decision and the director out there, her name is Stephanie Jose, J-O-O-S. I'm just confused why in the, um, on that page four, it says issuance from court or city legal division for written cons consent for an order of destruction. Do they have to then go through? So, so I, what they're talking about there is there can be cases that go through court that deem an animal dangerous and therefore it's going to be euthanized. So I think that those specific events short of a court order, Stephanie does her evaluation. If they get a court order for a particular animal, then that's what that is referring to. Actually, Matt, I think it's, I think it's when there's a hold order. So if you look under um, section seven, it's once there's been a hold order issued. And then it has to be released. I think it's not very clear in there, and I think it would be good to just clarify who or what entity makes that kind of decision under what grounds. Well, ju just to clarify, the, 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 the routine decision about whether to euthanize an animal is made by the county. I just didn't see any reference to that in this. If there is some, please let me know. There, so, there, there is a, there is a section that says that after the days. I yeah, it's, it it's a transfer of ownership. Eight. It's on, it's on the bottom of page four. Yep. And there's, there's time limits for various things. And then it says after those time, after those various time limits, the, um, the animals become property of the county. And then the later in that paragraph, the county is thereafter authorized to sell, adopt out, convey, euthanize, or otherwise dispose of the animal in whatever manner it deems appropriate. The county accepts sole responsibility for its discretionary decision. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, any other questions for staff? If not, I will entertain a motion. Hold a motion to, um, this is to recommend to council, right? And um, with a, I don't know, a change maybe to look into 
what those places would be in the extraordinary event that the city is responsible for housing these animals. Um, I'd like to just have some options of some organizations that are at least possibilities and remotely willing to take that on. So I guess- So I'm, there's there's would, uh, there's two things you could, you could say with no recommendation. So I, I moved to have this sent to city council with no recommendation. Um, and you, we can ask staff to provide the additional information if you'd like to make that motion. Yes, I would like to recommend with that additional additional information. Okay, I just want to be clear. So the motion is whether where it's going and what the what it is approved for, but then we have direction to staff in terms of what we would like to see in addition. Carol, uh, if, to the extent that this would be helpful, um, I I think we can get you the additional information. I don't see it being captured in the IGA because it's a separate issue. It's between, it's, it's our responsibility. It will, it will not be um, memorialized in the IGA. So we're happy to provide that information, but you needn't tie it up with the, um, with the uh, IGA unless you feel compelled to do that. Uh, so right now, Grace, let's clarify your motion before we move on. I don't know if Jay wanted to add something that might help clarify the motion. Well, I mean, this is a, a side note, but I think for me, at least in terms of a recommendation, we need clarification on this bay neuter language as well. Just was gonna add that in. Okay, so I guess my recommendation would be either to hold it in committee or to send it to city council with no recommendation. That as, as chair, those are the two options that I would suggest from council. Charisse? I just want to say something. So Grace, when you make when you make the motion, you say the entire resolution. I had to learn this too. <laughs> you say the entire motion, like the resolution number, da 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 da. And then you add your amendments or or something like that. And you can say you would like to to keep it in committee or you can um, move it to for city council with no recommendation or um, or something like that, but you can keep it in committee for further discussion if you want. You understand? So you can repeat, you can like say your say say the your motion again. I move that resolution, da 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 da, and then say what you want. What with it now? Because now I'm not even certain. I mean I'm <laughs> I'm down way. I don't know. I get it too. I get it. I understand. I totally get it. Okay. You want me to, well, I can try to do it and you can tell me if I'm, if I'm saying it correctly. Is that okay? Thank you. Okay. Um, I would like to make a, a motion for a resolution number 2021-05-021R, a resolution approving an intergovernmental agreement for animal impoundment services to be uh, to stay in committee for further discussion until we have further information regarding the the two issues that Grace and Jaya uh, discussed earlier. I'll second that. You made it easy All for right. me. So, so that, that motion is to keep this into committee. It was moved by Sharice and it was seconded by Grace. Is there any discussion on that motion? James. Yeah, it seems like that um, looking for some additional information on two two parts, the, the spaying, I understand because it's core to it, but the plan for housing animals is, is our own thing to resolve. It feels like that information and those things could be clarified by our city council meeting. So by making this choice that we're making to keep it in committee, it will not be done for three weeks. So the information that we're looking for and the clarification that we're looking for really feels like a one week possible kind of thing. If we get to council and it's not satisfactory, we can send it back to committee. That's an option too. But by, by choosing not to keep it in the committee, it'll be two weeks before we talk about it again. And then it'll be another week before it could be acted on uh, in city council. So I, I would prefer that we go ahead and send it without recommendation and see if it can get resolved for the city council meeting. Other discussion? I'm okay with that. So Sharice, would you like to amend your motion? I'd like to amend the motion um, to 
moving the resolution number 2021-05-021R uh, forward to city council with no recommendation pending information regarding spade and neutering in particular and uh, the issues regarding housing uh, uh, according to Grace. Grace, do you accept that change? Uh, yes, and I'll second if I need to. Okay, all right, so we have a new motion on the floor to send this with no recommendation, but to send it forward to city council. Is there further discussion? All right, will the clerk please call the roll? Ms. Wu? Yes. Mr. Evans? Yes. Ms. Hersey? Yes. Ms. Colasetti? Yes. Ms. Bishop? Yes. Ms. Wilkins? Yes. Mr. Quisenberry? Yes. All right, that moves forward to city council. The next item is ordinance number 2021-05015, an ordinance approving a final subdivision plat for South Ridge 8 subdivision, plan case number 2418-S21, and I believe Kat is presenting on this. Yes, hi everyone. Um, Hello. This is a request by Carl Hill and H. Allen Dooley for approval of a final plat and requested waiver for South Ridge 8 subdivision. Um, prior to the plan commission on May, oh man, not sure, or April 22nd, sorry, uh, staff re received two letters of public input. Uh, they were both re um, included in your packet. And at that meeting, the plan commission voted unanimously to forward the proposed final plat and requested waiver to city council with a recommendation of approval. Staff concurs. Uh, this is a location map of the property. Um, it was part of the Douglas Farm that was annexed into the city in 2001. It is in the South Ridge neighborhood located south of Windsor Road and east of Philo Road, south of the Pines Shopping Center. Uh, the property is L-shaped, but only the east-west portion of the lot is included in the proposed final plat. Um, and the proposed plat would subdivide the 6.32 acre tract into 27 lots to be developed as single family homes. This is a zoning map of the property. It is zoned R2 single family residential and there is R2 zoning and R3 zoning to the north and east and county agricultural zoning and uses to the south and west. Uh, the proposed subdivision is consistent with the requirements of the R2 zoning district and it would allow for the continuation of existing residential uses on the south side of Urbana. This is a future land use map. Uh, the comprehensive plan shows this area as residential suburban pattern and the proposed subdivision would be consistent with that designation. Uh, as I said before, the lot will be subdivided into 27 lots um, on the north and south sides of the extended Hillshire Drive. The proposed subdivision does not require a traffic impact analysis and the city engineer does not anticipate any access or congestion issues. The applicants have requested a waiver to allow Hillshire Drive to be paved to a width of 28 feet where a minimum width of 31 feet is required. This would match the width of Hillshire Drive and all existing streets in the neighborhood as a waiver was, was received for Southridge 5, 6, and 7 when they were platted. The waiver request also includes a condition that street parking will only be be permitted on the south side of Hillshire Drive, and that is to allow more room for emergency access. This is a screenshot of the uh, proposed final plat. It is consistent with a preliminary plat that was, that was approved by a uh, plan commission in plan case 2418S21. Uh, the proposed final plat is also consistent with the zoning designation and the comprehensive plan future land use for this um, land. The plat also meets the minimum requirements of the Urbana sub Subdivision and Land Development Code with the exception of the one requested waiver. And the requested waiver would not be harmful to other properties or negatively impact the health and safety of the community. Uh, so the City Council has the following options in this case. Approve the proposed final plat including the requested waiver. Approve the proposed final plat and deny the requested waiver 
or deny the proposed final plat? And if so, please state reasons for denial. Um, as I stated earlier, the plan commission voted unanimously to approve the preliminary plat and to forward the final plat and requested waiver to city council with a recommendation of approval. Staff concurs and I can take any questions for staff. Carl Hill is also here um, as the applicant and can make a statement as the developer. All right, uh, questions for Kat. See James. Yeah, I guess I guess my first question is um, I, I saw in the plan commission discussion that it was asked why Hillshire Drive isn't um, connected to Philo Road for this phase of the uh, development, and I, I'd really like to understand why not because this is becoming a, a kind of a corner with only two entrances to it, and um, can can. Was there a logical reason why they wouldn't go ahead and connect Hillshire Drive at this time? Yes, so, and I'll let Carl um, elaborate on that. He's available as well, but from a staff perspective and through conversations with the applicant, um, they're planning to connect Hillshire Drive to Philo Road with South Ridge 9, which should be platted uh, within the next year or so. Um, but for this point in time, they're developing on the north and south sides of Hillshire Drive and not extending past that east-west strip into the northwest strip of that L-shaped piece of land. So it doesn't make sense for them to connect Hillshire Drive at this point in time without platting that land as well. Um, so they're only proposing Hillshire Drive extension to this point, but with South Ridge 9, they will plan to connect Hillshire Drive to Philo Road. So do we have some kind of commitment? I, I know the developers here, we have some kind of commitment that that will follow along fairly quickly I believe the, those are their plans. And like I said, Carl can um, make a statement on that as well, but South Ridge 9 is certainly in the pipeline. Carl, are you able to comment on that? Uh, yes, are you ready for me? Yes. Okay, now do you want just the information that you're asking at the moment, or do you want a quick history of what we have and why we're going final plat as well as the preliminary plat? Let's start with the question and then we'll go back, circle back. Okay, we have people, right now we've used all the lots and I have a builder that needs more lots immediately. And if I include the entrance or the exit to uh, Vital Road, it's going to add quite a bit of time because of the engineering and some of the issues that we have to deal with as far as water mains and bike trails. So we decided to stop where we are so that we could have these lots available, hopefully by September, October. And then the plan is to go ahead and start. And while we're start the ninth phase, as far as the design and development, because we have issues that we want to speak with the city regarding. All right. Okay. Um, I did have another question. Um, this is regarding the waiver. Um, I did, I did some, looking at the existing uh, Hillshire Drive. And I, and you mentioned, Kat, that it was, a, that it was done at 28 feet, but it, it doesn't look like that. Um, it looks like it is the 31 feet. It is 28 feet. Uh, well, um, the other question I have is, uh, of course, Meyer Ridge is 31 feet, it looks like, 31. through this. Through yes. this. this if, if this does get connected to Philo Road, it will be a, an alternate entrance of feeder into this area. And I, that would make me not, um, not as uh, quick to approve a waiver to make this a narrower road because it's going to be a, a feeder for the subdivision. Yeah, that's the same question that came up at the plan commission. It's also the same question that we answered in 2001 when we provided the uh, preliminary plat for the whole 60 acres. Uh, they decided that Hillshire would be a local collector. And because of uh, being uh, residential in nature as it is, a narrower road with slow traffic down and also provide more grass for water to be absorbed to rather than providing more runoff. Uh, we have Trails Drive just to the north, which is 33 feet. And that is going to be the main collector, we might say for the east-west, and that's why Hillshire Drive was given that waiver because they thought it was not um, 
a good plan. I have a few comments on behalf of staff as well. Um, one of the reasons staff supported this waiver was to encourage slow uh, vehicle speeds through a residential neighborhood. Um, typically, you see that with narrower roads, um, cars don't travel as fast. They don't feel, um, you know, as safe to travel as fast on narrower roads, especially in residential areas. Um, just additionally, the city engineer did review this, and we've had multiple conversations about the waiver request. Um, and street pavement with in this area, and he is in support of the waiver as well. James, does that answer your question? All right, Grace. Uh, thank you. Um, my question was about that water runoff, and it looks like there's no plan for um, a need for additional stuff because the stormwater system was already kind of put in for this whole big picture project. Right. Is that correct? Um, and I just want to say, cause this is board six and looking through the public comments, a lot of people did have concerns about water there with this new development. Um, and especially that area, once you go back behind, you know, the big open spot, there's a lot of kind of differences with height and the way water flows back there. Um, so I just wanted to- um, we, resolved, we resolved all those issues in 2001 when we did the main plat and we came up with all of the water runoff calculations and we determined that we were a little over the requirement with our retention cells. And as far as the runoff and the road, um, did you look into any permeable or semi-permeable paving so that you could have? No, definitely not. Those do not hold up under traffic. So what we're doing is we have storm sewers that run the water to the retention cells and they were developed that way to not cause a problem for the occupants. We've designed the lots and the grading of every lot so that the water on each lot goes to the street. It doesn't go to a neighbor. So the only, in fact, when we uh, did the retention cells, we buried 2000 feet of pipe so that the farmer that is to the east of us would not have to deal with water runoff coming out of the retention cell. So he is an out drier than he was typically before we did our development. All right, other questions for Kat or for Carl? Okay, with that, I'll um, take a motion if somebody's willing to give a motion. Actually, Mary Alice, I believe Mr. Hill wanted to kind of present more generally. Perhaps I misheard, okay. but just wanted to give him that opportunity. You wanted to give us some more historical information, Carl? And Grace yeah, has her hand up again. First of all, I'd like to welcome the council people. It's been 10 years since our last phase and 10 years since I have visited uh, the council chambers. So the new members, welcome. Uh, <laughs> it's exciting, as you found out tonight. Um, when I restarted uh, Myra Ridge back in 1988, uh, I took over 47 acres from Thompson Lumber Company who gave it up and uh, I worked with the park district and we put in 13 acres of park and lots of bike trail. In fact, uh, at this point we have over 3,000, almost 4,000 lineal feet of 10 foot wide bike trails. We have almost 20 acres of park that we put in the, the sections one, uh, South Ridge one through eight so far. And we have one more section nine to do, which will finish out that 60 acres. Uh, we have approximately 189 units in this 60 acres. We had 145 in the previous 47 acres. Uh, those amounted to about a third of an acre per lot. Uh, when you look at the number of acreage with the number of uh, housing units that were there. Uh, we have smaller lots. We designed these lots so that people wouldn't have to spend the whole weekend uh, taking care of the yards. So we have people that just wanted a nice place to live and not have a large lot. So that's why we have the 20 acres and that's why we have uh, the 4,000 feet of bike trails to give plenty of space. Um, we have a lot of east-west oriented streets so that we can take advantage of solar. I built a lot of solar homes uh, previous to even starting this section and became very conscious of the energy efficiency requirements that we would be needing in the future. I've planted about 200 trees over the years myself. 
Uh, I've not bothered the, the arborist with trying to get trees started. Uh, information I give to the buyers of the properties, and then they can have the lot, the trees put on their property. Um, I lived in the subdivision from 1993 to 2013 in three different houses. Uh, we've tried to make it a place where people can have uh, pride of ownership, take pride of ownership, and me and other residents of the subdivision have been able to help others uh, with their fences, with their trees, with whatever to keep the subdivision looking good. Uh, we're very proud of the area. If you haven't been out there, I would say go out and visit, but be careful Vernon Drive because we have seven houses under construction there right now. And we have a few more around the corner. But last year and this year, we've had a uh, demand like we've never seen. We sold 15 lots last year and it looks like we're doing 20 or 25 this year, which is the reason we ran out of lots and which is the reason we're trying very hard to get this done quickly so that people that want these homes can get them built. Uh, so that's, that's in a nutshell. Thank you. Grace, do you have another question? Uh, yes, I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about the energy efficiency and kind of looking towards future codes and standards uh, with this particular part of the project. Well, I am, I'm not a contractor anymore as far as building. Uh, I'm trying to retire, I'm 75 years old and I'm just selling lots and I'm trying to bring in builders to build my homes. Uh, the standards that we build to are the national standards. Uh, the, the builders that come in there and build the homes uh, just have to follow those and they have to get permits from the city and they have to show that the city, show the city inspectors that they are building uh, energy efficient homes. All right, other questions? Okay, can I have a motion? Shonda, would you like to give a motion? Yes, I move that ordinance number 2021-05-015 and ordinance approving the final subdivision Platte South Ridge 8 subdivision um, be sent to city council for final approval. Recommendation for approval? Recommendation for approval. Okay. I'll second. All right, moved by Chandra and seconded by Sharice. Any discussion? Jaya? I just have a quick comment from listening to the plan commission and I don't know if this is the right time to bring it up. I do think that this has been really thoughtful and I appreciate the, the reasoning behind the waiver, but a number of residents brought up concerns about trash and noise violations. So if we could make sure that that information about how to address that is provided to our residents as this construction continues, I think that would be important, but I have no, no concerns about moving it forward. And then I uh, had a question for staff. Uh, usually you provide the plan commission draft minutes. And if you can provide those by the next meeting, that would be helpful. Absolutely, I'll make sure they're here. Thank you. All right, is there any discussion before we take the vote? No, will the clerk please call the roll. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Wu? Yes. Mr. Evans? Yes. Ms. Hersey? Yes. Ms. Colasetti? Yes. Ms. Bishop? Yes. Ms. Wilkins? Yes. Mr. Quisenberry? Yes. All right, that moves forward to City Council. Thank you very much. Thank you, folks. All right, the next one is ordinance number 2021-05016, an ordinance amending Urbana City Code chapter three, section three hyphen 43 for increasing the number of class R and T one liquor licenses for Sitara Indian cuisine, INC. I don't know what DBA means. Doing business as. Yes. Oh, thank <laughs> you, at 114 South Ray Street in Urbana, the mayor. 
I'll speak to this one and the next item on the agenda, there's two liquor licenses. So the other item on the agenda is ordinance number 2021-05-017, which is an ordinance amending Urbana City Code chapter three, section 3-43, increasing the number of class R and T2 liquor licenses for CBOCS West Inc. doing business as Cracker Barrel Old Country Store number 129 at 2101 North Kenyon Road. So I'll be wearing my uh, uh, local liquor control commissioner hat for these two items. Um, as you may know, the city of Urbana doesn't cap numbers of liquor licenses for any particular category like some cities. Each time we have an applicant for a new liquor license or a change in the type of license, it comes before city council. So in this case, we have applications. They actually are for two new liquor licenses. The first for Sitara Indian Cuisine for the Tres Nopales restaurant, which is on South Ray Street, formerly was the Satara Indian restaurant. You may remember that. They have applied for a R&T1 license, and this is for selling all types of alcoholic liquor, so beer, wine, and mixed drinks. If you haven't had a chance, and I'm sure you've done all your reading so far, but if you wanted to go to Urbana City Code, Chapter three, Urbana City Code was completely rewritten um, and approved last February. We, uh, we, we started from scratch, rewrote the liquor code to really adapt it to how businesses wanted to do business today and to meet the needs of the uh, license holders and really of the community. So the new categories from that uh, rewriting of the code, we included the R&T license for R&T one and R&T two. So the Trace Nopales are applying for R&T1, which is the sale of all alcoholic liquor. Um, for the Cracker Bell store, this is a new license for them. They're applying for R&T2, and that is for a license for beer and wine sales only. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. Questions for the mayor. James? Yeah, I assume... R&T is restaurant and tavern? Restaurant and tavern, yes. And, and um, I, so if this is Sitara doing business as a Mexican restaurant now, didn't they have a liquor license previously? Yes, but this is a new business, so. Okay, so that, that license is gone? Yes, point. Sitara okay. no longer exists as a uh, business entity as far as we know, but they're applying under uh, the uh, Tres Nopales. So the numbers we see here now already reflect that that license went away when Sitara ceased operating? Correct. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So what you'll see under, I'm sure I should have explained that. So on the left in that chart is classification. Those are the different liquor license categories. And then um, under the right-hand column, it's the number of licenses authorized. And each time you approve a license, that will increase if a uh, company goes out of business, then that number decreases. All right, other questions for the mayor? Chandra. Yes, yeah, so is for Cracker Barrel, is that beer and wine to be consumed on the premise? And if in the future they would want to expand that liquor license, do they have the opportunity or do they have to reapply and go through this process again? It, it is, is for on-premise on consumption um, currently. And yes, if they wanted to expand to the sale of all liquors, they would have to come back to council. All right, if uh, there are no other questions, um, there were two items we'll have to take uh, each resolution, sorry, each ordinance, uh, separate a separate motion for each one. So if somebody would like to make a motion. I can give it a try. <laughs> All right, Jaya. Um, I'll move to, I don't actually, I don't know how to do this. So, so if you would like to move, if, if, yeah, you need to read out the, the whole statement. And then Not after that, that, then you say, I move to send this to city council with a okay. recommendation for approval, no recommendation. Okay, 
So I'll move ordinance number 2021-05-016 and ordinance amending Urbana City Code chapter three, section three-43. Do I have to read the rest of it? Yeah. Okay, increasing number of class RNT-1 liquor licenses for Satara Indian Cuisine, Inc. DBA Tresnopales, 114 South Race Street, Urbana, Illinois, um, on to city council for approval. Yep. Yeah, with a recommendation for approval. There you go. I'm getting there. <laughs> All right, moved by Jaya, seconded by Sharice. Any discussion? No? Will the clerk please call the roll? Ms. Wu? Yes. Mr. Evans? Yes. Ms. Hersey? Yes. Ms. Colasetti? Yes. Ms. Bishop? Yes. Ms. Wilkins? Yes. Mr. Quisenberry? Yes. All right, that moves on to city council. The uh, next ordinance on the docket, would anybody like to make a motion for ordinance 017? Who else is feeling brave? <laughs> James, you've unmuted yourself. Would you like to make a motion? Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try this out. Um, I'd make a motion for ordinance number 2021. 05017, an ordinance amending Urbana City Code Chapter 3, Section 3 43, increasing the number of Class RT2 liquor licenses for C Box West Incorporated doing business as Cracker Barrel Old Country Store Number 129 at 2101 North Kenyon Road in Urbana, Illinois. I move this to Council with recommendation for approval. All right, is there a second? A second. All right, so moved by James, seconded by Chandra. Any discussion? Uh, yes. Uh, Grace? Um, uh, I'm not sure about this one. I you know, definitely heard and took in the comment um, in our public comments about the issues with Cracker Barrel and the opposition to this, with it being a family restaurant, having a history of racial discrimination, and then also I think being right there on the interstate on one of our most treacherous interstates. I mean, my I believe that 74 there is, you know, the highest traffic um, accident incidents that we have, and um, so I would be down for not approving this one for those reasons. Just wanted to express that. All right, any other discussion? Diane? I could respond if that's appropriate. Sure. A couple of things. One is we have several other restaurants holding um, liquor licenses in that area. Hickory River is one. Um, the Mexican restaurant up in North Cumming Cunningham is another. So there are a number of restaurants very close to the interstate holding liquor licenses. Number two, we haven't had complaints about Cracker Barrel, about the local Cracker Barrel restaurant as far as discrimination. If there was in complaints to be filed, it could be done with our human rights or, uh, officer soon to be hired, I, I might say. Um, so as far as the record of the local store, we haven't had a history of complaints. I can't speak to um, the national, but we do have a number of other restaurants very close to the interstate. And three, I would point out just in general, um, and when you start to get into the budget, you'll be seeing is our revenue from sales, food and beverage tax and liquor tax is a very important part of our budget. And interestingly, Cracker Barrel kind of flies under the radar. Uh, we don't, you know, think of it as being a local, well, you know, it's a national chain, so it's not a locally owned or banner restaurant, but they perform very well as far as generating revenue for the city, which we need to support our core services and programs in the city. So um, they've been a very good corporate citizen here in the city of Urbana. And for that reason, um, we do recommend that we do ask that you support this. Um, that, that said, we always do say a liquor license is a privilege, not a right. And if there are issues related to any of the individual liquor license holders, and sometimes we've had that, then we take those, then we deal with those cases on an individual basis. All right, uh, Diane, I have a question. Is I'm not sure if Urbana Garden serves uh, meals past uh, breakfast and lunch, but if they do, do they have a liquor license? Uh, they do serve dinner. I, I offhand, I am not sure they're one of our holders. 
Um, I, that brings up another point. Deputy Liquor Commissioner is my assistant, Kate Levy, and she would be able to answer that question on the spot. But I believe, actually, I believe they do. Now that I think about it, yes, they do hold a liquor license. Yeah, I think they just do beer and wine. Yeah. Um, okay. So again, this, this restaurant is asking for beer and wine, not hard alcohol. Sherry? Yeah, I just I just want to say and I and I take Wayne's uh, comment also in into consideration, but um, I've been a customer at Cracker Barrel several times, um, not so much since the pandemic, but um, what I've never had any issues racially or anything else. They there are uh, several African American not just servers, but people that are hostessing, managers. Uh, that's one thing I've noticed. Um, and I do notice those things when I go into any restaurant, having been a server and having been a hostess <laughs> and having worked in that, that particular uh, field. Um, I've never gotten any, I've never had any issue at all with, with uh, their service. I, uh, uh, there have been several uh, African American patrons that I've known that we have, you know, bumped into while while there. A bunch of us not eating together, but just happened to be seeing each other. So um, the, I've not had those issues. Now, what their national chain does, um, I'm not privy to. I don't I don't have that information. But I would say that. Uh, the local Cracker Barrel has always been uh, uh, very good in, to, in, in dealing with uh, the community from my perspective. I can only say from my perspective. That's it. Grace? I just had a quick question about the timing of the liquor sales. Um, just in general, and with this RT2, if there's a timing of sales, like is it after a certain time in the evening, or like if they're open at six o'clock in the morning for breakfast, do alcohol sales start then? As, as the, each individual restaurant is free to set their hours for alcohol sales. I'm kind of doubting they're going to sell sell alcohol at breakfast. We do have. Um, the latest they can sell alcohols, any establishment can sell alcohol is 2 a.m. and not before 6 a.m. That's state law, but I do not know there's particular store hours. So that's up to the restaurant outside of that 2 a.m. Yeah. yeah. Chandra? So I, I lived on, I live on this end of town near Cracker Barrel and the only concern that I can think of about having um, an establishment that serves liquor on this end would be that sort of windy curve coming around and there's like no stop sign before the light on Canyon. And again, I pass through this little intersection all the time. So I'm wondering if there has been sort of maybe like a traffic study um, about adding a stop sign there. And especially if this restaurant would get a liquor license that may increase um, visitation to the restaurant um, and also of course, increase beverage consumption. So that's just um, something that I thought of that could be a concern. Diane, do you wanna to respond to that? Um, well, we haven't done a traffic study. I could say if it, if it becomes an issue that what that could be something we would do, but at this point, um, you know, we haven't uh, we have not done a traffic study related to I'm, the liquor license. I have seen numerous number of accidents at this sort of intersection at Kenyon and Cunningham, and so I mean I would rather this may not be the right form for that, but rather be proactive than reactive if something happens. So um, I love to talk uh, with some, okay. whoever the proper person would be about maybe doing a traffic study okay. and see how a stop sign would be effective there. Sure, okay, That that uh, in that case, that would be the traffic commission. Okay. So a concern like that would go to the traffic commission. Thank and you. The engineers would consider that, yeah. All right, any further discussion? All right, and I believe, was it, uh, James, did you move that forward? Is that right? 
Yes, he yeah. did. Okay, thank you. And then who seconded? Sharice, did you second that? Chandra. 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 I'm sorry. I, I didn't take notes. All right. Um, so the motion on the floor right now is to send this to city council with a recommendation for approval. Will this clerk please call the roll? Okay. Ms. Wu? Yes. Mr. Evans? Yes. Ms. Hersey? Yes. Ms. Colasetti? Yes. Ms. Bishop? Yes. Ms. Wilkins? Yes. Mr. Quisenberry? Yes. All right. That motion carries and that will move on to city council. Um, the next item is a discussion for Frasca redevelopment from community development. Is Lori doing that one? Or Carol? I'm starting. It's a, it's a team effort. Um, Steph McMahon and I are gonna are going to do this together. Um, and and she's having a storm out where she is. So if we lose her, <laughs> Lori will jump in. So um, I'm giving the history of a um, of, of redevelopment agreement that we currently have with Frasca and then uh, Steph is going to explain the, um, the new proposal. We're bringing this to you uh, today as a discussion item because we didn't have it ready. Um, we're still having a little pass back and forth with um, Frasca on language, but we would like to bring this to council for decision making. So we thought we'd get you know, any questions you have out tonight. So I, I've done a, a, just one slide that I'm hoping Jason is gonna put up um, to describe the existing redevelopment agreement that we have with Frasca. Jason, do you have that? There we go, yay. So just for those of you who don't know, Frasca is a company that has been in this area since 1958 and they build flight simulators. And um, they, uh, they also run a um, private airfield off of Airport Road. So back in, so this is a 2012 slash 2015 redevelopment agreement because it was, it was amended a couple of times. And it was for a, a three phase project back in, um, in, in that 2012, 2015 timeframe where Frasca was anticipating doing some expansion. They were renovating um, some existing space and then building. And it could have been, uh, if they had built the entire three phase project, 12,000 square feet of additional space. They ended up only building uh, two of those phases. And the, there were two primary components to the redevelopment agreement. First was a real estate tax abatement. And um, we did the enterprise zone um, little training tonight because this is in the enterprise zone, but the bulk of this agreement is facilitated by being in the tax increment financing district, which is a, a lot longer kind of um, explanation training that we wanted to do. So this is fairly straightforward what we're bringing to you tonight, but we will be doing a deep dive into TIF. So the real estate tax abatement was for a 10 year term. And the way that it works is you establish a base, which is whatever's existing, that's your baseline. And then when they build whatever they're gonna build. So in this free three phase project, there were actually three possible increments of additional tax because there would be additional value. And then there would be a tax associated with that. And they would be eligible for 60% of that incremental tax in the form of a rebate for that 10 year period. And it was again, dependent on the scope of the project. The maximum benefit under that would have been if for full 10 years, if they had done the full project and so forth was $425,000. They, they were, were not eligible for that because they did not do the last phase of the project. But the, the, the really kind of important piece of this was that the expressed intent of the project was to add at least 40 jobs. So they were doing this expansion. Now, at the same time, the city had committed to reconstruct Airport Road. They wanted the road upgraded and they wanted it widened. And so the cost of Airport Road at that time was about uh, $3.2 million. And because the cost of the road was being 
um, paid for out of TIF, we had to wait for the balance to accrue to the point where we could pay for that. So it was put into the CIP um, and it, it, had a, a, it was a few years out and Frasca was interested in accelerating that. So at the time, um, there was a grant available from the state economic development um, program grant that, that the city applied for and received that allowed us to accelerate the construction because we got grant money up front that was would help. So of that $3.2 million, about $1.4 million came from the state. And so there was there were reporting requirements that Frasca had to meet. And then there, it was all built around this, this idea of that they would add at least 40 jobs. And if the if the jobs target was not met in five years, then the grant would um, potentially need to be repaid. So here we are, fast forward to 2021. And what actually happened was that there was a retrenchment that Frasca went through and they did not, not only did they not add jobs, they actually lost jobs. So we wanted to call this to your attention because there's this, there's this issue hanging out there that we potentially have to pay, repay this grant. And, and what I want you to understand is there's language in the grant agreement that says that um, they need to do, make reasonable efforts to you know, meet the jobs target under the economic condi conditions prevailing at the time. So in their industry, it was, it was declining, it wasn't expanding, which is not what they expected, but um, we, we still have a case to make with the state that um, we, we don't have to, you know, that we shouldn't have to repay the, the grant either in part or in full, we, but we haven't had the opportunity to make that case yet because the folks at the state have basically not been in the office um, through the entire period of COVID. But the other thing I wanted to call your attention to is the fact that if we hadn't gotten the grant, the city committed TIF money to pay for the road regardless. So we would be paying for the road. We would have paid for the road regardless. So, but this is an open issue and I didn't want you to, sometime down the road to be surprised by it if it came back around because it, it does fit into an overall context. And then the last little piece I'll add before um, I turn it over to Steph is that in the event that we have to repay the grant, uh, Frasca will pay um, $50,000 of that amount. So I'll turn it over to Steph now to explain um, what we've currently been discussing with them and their and their expansion that they are um, on the cusp of starting. Sure. Yeah. So next week I'll be bringing a proposal to you because Frasca is doing a new project now. They're adding an 11,000 square foot building for flight simulation that's going to cost approximately 1.6 million dollars. And they've asked for um, funding from the city through, from TIF to help out with this project. And because they're located in TIF 4, they are eligible um, for that. They are in the enterprise zone, so they're receiving sales tax exemption on building materials, or they will when they start building. Um, so what we would like to propose offering them for your discussion next week and vote next week, hopefully, is 50% of the increment, so 50% in the increase from their base level taxes to whatever their new tax rate is gonna be when the project is done. 50% of that increment for two years for a maximum of $50,000. And Frasca is aware that this is kind of what we've put on the table and um, they have, they've seen the redevelopment agreement and like the direction it's going. So if you guys would be in favor of that next week, you could approve it or not. So, um, that's kind of where we are right now and what we would bring to you next week. And there will be, all this information will be in your packet that you'll receive before council. The one, the one thing I just wanna connect the dots for you is that in devising this new, um, this new um, redevelopment agreement, if we had not gotten the, the EDP grant to accelerate the road construction, the TIF would have paid for the road entirely and and Frasca would not have paid anything. 
So in the event we have to repay the grant, they, 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 this $50,000 is the maximum that we'll receive from them, but it's also the maximum that they can get under this redevelopment agreement for the two year period. All right, question, Sharice? Yeah, I just wanted to ask, um, so we may have to repay a grant that we got so that they could be there, correct? Well, they were there already. They've been there since 1958. Okay, so we got the, I'm, I'm just trying to figure this out. Yeah, <laughs> so okay. we got the, the, grant, the grant to build the road or we got the grant to help them expand? We got the grant to accelerate the construction of the road. So we didn't have the money to build it Let's say they wanted it next year and we only had the money to build it five years from now and they wanted it sooner and, and we got the grant so that we could, we had all the money we needed so we could build it next year as opposed to waiting. Okay, so what I, I guess what I'm asked, what I wanna know is this, um, because they'll give us $50,000, which is- If we have to repay the grant, yes. If we have to repay the grant. What about the um, employment issue? Will they ever get up to at least 40 people employed like they said they would? Well, at the time, at the time, I don't, I don't, I don't have my notes in front of me about what, where they are currently with their employment um, numbers, but at the time they had 178 employees. And so I don't know what that current number is, but um, they still employ a fair number of people there. I, I, I think that's not on, that's, that's certainly not associated with this program. It won't be 40. I think there, there might be a handful of new employees, but um, I don't know that their industry is, is um, that, you know, it's become a lot more automated. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I, under, I understand, you know, how, because, uh, you know, last year was pandemic in 2012, it was a recession. Uh, <laughs> so, <Nope>. say <laughs> so what? It's always something. It's always something. And I get that. But at the same time, and so I understand, you know, everybody was laying people off at, at that time because everybody was broke. So I get that. What I, what I want to understand, though, is that even, you know, eventually, if, if they haven't already hired the 40 people that they, they had expected to hire at the time, uh, Will there be, is there a way that we can say, well, you know, you know, it would help, it would help with the trust uh, between the, the entities if they, if they haven't hired those 40 people that they get up, they make, at least make that commitment coming out because there are a lot of there's a lot of unemployment there are opportunities it seems like there should be opportunities for for uh for them to hire if 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 it's possible oh um I, I i don't think it's realistic for for them i mean we had a conversation with them oh i don't know maybe a year and a half ago when we were talking about the grant itself and and where they stood in their in their hiring numbers and I don't know that they think they'll ever get back to the numbers that they had when they, before they even anticipated going to the additional 40. I, I just don't know that they could make a commitment like that. Okay. I understand why you would, why you would want that. I just don't think that's realistic for them. They build these, like, I, I don't know, Steph, if you, if you, if you know any more of the detail, I remember reading about this simulator. They're very expensive, but they build them and then they, I think they ship them off to other countries where they, you know, they, they there is a helicopter sim, simulator, this particular um, building, because the, the simulator itself is taller than any building that they have there and they have to build a new building in order to build the simulator. So it's, they build big things, very expensive things, but they're, it's not like a, it's not like a, an assembly line. It's very, they chase contracts for years. Okay. Uh, Grace. Thanks. Um, so I was wondering if that, if the airport road project is completed or only that part that was funded by the grant so far. What we committed to was completed, which is from um, Willow Road to 
um, the west side of Cunningham. That's but that was what the commitment was, and and um, that's the part that the grant funded. But it would if we hadn't gotten the grant, that was the part that we had committed to for them. It seems like so Airport Road you said was that three point two million, and we got funding for one point four million section that's complete, or is that well, not? There, was a, there was a local match, so we we got money from the grant so that it accelerated the the um, our ability to do the project because we had some local money, but we didn't have a sufficient amount to, to undertake the project on our own. So getting that grant accelerated our ability to build it in a timely manner, uh, you know, on their schedule as opposed to our schedule. So the there was 1,840,000 of local match. And that encompasses the 3.2 million total cost of the whole project that is complete. Yes. yes. And you said without that um, accelerated funds, the city would have been able to get other funding for the entire thing? It would have come out of the TIF. Um, so there's a, in, in, a, in a TIF, um, similar to, to what an individual project will generate, you designate a TIF area, and we'll explain all this in more detail in, in a, when we do our deep dive, but you basically designate an area and then you set a baseline and then as taxes, as, as the, um, what do you call that? Equalized assessed value. Basically as the values rise, you skim off that incremental tax and put it into an account, a TIF fund. And then we, as the city, because we are the, I'll, I'll call us the custodians of the TIF, um, then we d develop projects that advance the goals of the TIF but we're largely spending the money of our taxing partners because we're not the primary tax generator. I mean, the school, the school district is a huge partner of ours. So if we hadn't gotten the grant, we would have, so the, the local match came out of TIF, then we got the grant. If we hadn't gotten the grant, we would have waited for that increment to build up to the point where it was all TIF money. Okay, so if we have to pay this back would that just be out of the city or is there still chance the tip. it would come out of the tip in the future or those TIF funds? If we have to pay it back. It will be TIF money that pays it back. Okay. Thanks. All right, Diane, did you want to say something? I just wanted to add um, a little bit more information about what Frasca does. They really build these very complex and almost customized um, simulators once they get in order and uh, when we toured the the, the uh, facility several years ago they explained that they build them on site then they dismantle them they ship them all over the world and then they go and reassemble them on site so they're very very um, customized to the specific need of the client and this newest um, this newest uh, order is is that as well all right, are there any other questions for staff, for Carol or Stephanie? Thank you, Grace. Um, why Airport Road in um, Like, was there a, I mean, I understand for Frasca that that was an important thoroughfare, but I kind of, from the city perspective and using TIF funds, wondering um, what was kind of the city's benefit or motivation for um, Airport Road improvements or extension? Uh, I only know what I read in the, um, I only know what I read in the um, council memos that were written when the, when the agreement came, um, it, you know, there was, it was 2012 and there was an amendment in 2015. And at the time, and I'm hoping that maybe we can find this report, there's reference made to a report that um, the Regional Plan Commission did as part of the uh, the grant package that talked about the economic spinoff, the benefits of these additional 40 jobs and the construction and how that, how that sort of amplified in the economy. Um, I think knowing what we know now, I think it was, it was definitely something that made sense for the state to fund. Um, I don't know that all that, that benefit accrued to the city of Urbana, it accrued to this to this area. So you know, to the county, to the region. Um, so I, I think there was 
I, I think that was that was probably it. Um, and and we anticipated that the tax base would increase as a result. And I would just like to add, Grace, I think Carol's been here for three years. Is that right, Carol? Almost three. <laughs> Almost three years. So this this took place before um, her tenure. And and Lori, how long have you been working in the planning, you know, prior to community development? Um, Wednesday will be my sixth anniversary. And um, just to add to what Carol said, there was also, I'll call it a pipe dream. I don't know if it is more than that. Um, the thought that connecting Airport Road all the way over to Lincoln would be beneficial. Maybe that's where some of the economic numbers came in uh, in order to have that connection. So that, that might've also played a role. So Grace, I just wanted to give you a background saying that everybody here was not part of that conversation <laughs> when it took place in 2011. Okay, uh, no other questions for, oh, Jaya? Yeah, I think with that being said, that recognition of maybe things not working up so much, can I get clarification on, and I know we'll probably talk about this next week, what is the benefit to the city for this new proposal? Well, we're expecting there to be increment, you know, that there'll be a, a tax benefit. And it, this, this, um, this, uh, what do I want to say? The abatement, which is a refund, they have to they have to pay the tax and then apply for a refund that burns off in two years, and then that that increment then flows to the to all the taxing districts. Well, it'll be in the TIF until the TIF expires, but it, it's a it's tax increment, which is what the um, that's what the intent of the ta to the the TIFs is all about is building the tax base the property tax base. So I appreciate that we're going to do a deep dive, but for those of us who are new to tips, uh, could we get sent some materials to look at before next week so we can be more informed coming into that conversation? We can sure. actually do the TIF uh, deep dive next week. We thought if- Both. On, <laughs> so we're not learning about it right before we vote on something? Yeah, we'll, we'll get you something. We'll, 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 get you, we'll get you TIF 101 materials before awesome. then. Thank you. All right, any final questions for staff? Okay, and I actually I had a question. So this is coming directly to city council and not going to committee of the whole. Is that because it, the process, did it go through plan commission? What no, is the process? Go, this doesn't go through plan commission. Um, they're, they're very anxious to begin construction and we've been passing things back and forth. And we thought if, we, if you were comfortable that we would bring this for discussion and then bring it directly to council. I mean, it's not ideal, but it was our hybrid way of, of moving things along. If you decide you want to send it to committee after next week, then you know that's certainly your prerogative. Okay, all right. Now, the last item on our agenda is council input and communications. Charisse? Um, yes, I would just like to acknowledge, um, um, well, first of all, Welcome to all the new city council members. And I'm sorry I haven't gotten to meet any of you in, in person, <laughs> but I will, I'm sure. The other thing I wanted to say is I wanted to acknowledge that um, we all know Reverend Dr. Evelyn Underwood. Um, last week, um, she lost her eldest son to COVID. And um, I just want to uh, send out prayers and thoughts and ask that everybody on the council do the same uh, for the loss of her son, uh, James, and um, James Jr. And um, there will be um, uh, services at the vineyard uh, 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 visitation um, on May 8th. There's a, a wake at the Williams um, um, funeral home on Fourth, I think it's Fourth Street in, in Champaign um, the night before. And um, so uh, I know none, you know, none of you guys, I went to school with Jimmy. He lived across the street from me for uh, my childhood. So I know him, I, I know him personally. And, it, and I know that she's devastated. And I just wanted to acknowledge that and, and let her know that uh, and, you know, as a alderman of Ward 3, and she's been a champion of Ward 3 since I was a child, um, that I, I want to personally acknowledge her loss and just, and 
just say I'm how sorry I am. Does anybody else like to write a comment tonight, Chandra? Yes, um, just wanted to say thank you for the welcome and so excited to be here. Um, I appreciate the staff taking time to give us presentations over the last couple of weeks to sort of um, help us hit the ground running. And so I'm looking forward to the continued presentations and thank you for bearing with us as we you know, try to um, do these ordinances tonight too. So that's all. Thank you. Jaya? I think Grace actually had her hand up first. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> she said, go ahead. Um, I, I would echo the words of, of thanks and appreciation, um, the welcome from, you know, the seated members um, or who were already seated and um, best, you know, appreciate the, the departing, that sounds sad, but the former members for their service as well. I also want to acknowledge that I appreciated that former council member Roberts brought up the made a walkabout. I know that um, my, my friends and family enjoyed getting to see more of our local um, galleries this past weekend. Um, so I appreciated that attention. Um, related to spending a little bit more time and attention on things, I think we're seeing that we're struggling a little bit with Zoom, like so many <laughs> aspects of our life. Um, it was brought up in public comment and I think we could see that even during our meetings that sometimes the little virtual hands especially are getting missed. Um, so maybe trying to be a little bit more thoughtful about taking more time uh, to notice those. I know it's very easy to do, but um, I, I do hear that our community is mentioning that they're they're not getting their chance to speak. So wanting to be a little bit more mindful about that. Um, and then saying, I think there might be a need for a little bit more parliamentary procedure training. I will say for myself, I am definitely still learning. Um, I think that it's helpful for our community to know too, so that other folks who are thinking about running for office at some point don't feel so discouraged. So I appreciate that these trainings have been public and if we could continue that by adding some more in around parliamentary procedure, I think that would be helpful as well. Thank All you. Right. Diane? Yeah, just wanted to, sh just wanted to share a couple of things. One, an announcement. Um, this Saturday, May 8th, is going to be the Votercade for National John Lewis Voting Rights Action Day. There's seven local organizations sponsoring this, plus the city of Urbana. Um, they, the motorcade will begin at the Country Fair Shopping Center in Champaign at 1 o'clock. It will be um, making its way via two different routes through uh, Champaign and then into Urbana. And they intend to end up around 3 p.m. at Lincoln Square. There will be speakers, music, food, and it's a celebration. And I assume they're registering voters as well. So everyone's encouraged to participate. And um, this is a recognition and a celebration of um, very important uh, actions and need to uh, uh, fight against voter suppression and to get people registered to vote. Uh, secondly, I wanted to address a comment that was made during public input last week and clarify. Uh, there was a uh, claim that the city of Urbana was censoring comments on the Imagine Urbana website. The Imagine Urbana website is our site that's set up to take public input on um, our comprehensive plan. And one part of that website is has an Urbana places map where people can pin, put a pin in it and then talk about that location in Urbana. The Earth City of Urbana is not censoring comments. This website is being hosted by a third party platform. It's the uh, global moderation team from Bang the Table. So some of you may be very familiar with this public engagement um, company. But the way this process works is that when a member of the public wants to post anything on the Imagine Urbana website hosted by Bang the Table, the users first register and then you can post comments. And then part of the registration process as anytime you register, you have to check, I agree to the terms of use and um, which lists the moderation rules and then the privacy policy. I won't read all the moderation policy uh, comments, but a couple of the um, uh, points of the policy are relevant to the um, 
comments that were made last week. One was never identify a staff member of the consulting organization, in this case, that's the city of Urbana by name. The second one is don't defame anyone or the organization. The comment is defamatory if it lowers or harms the reputation of a person or organization. If you want to assault, insult anyone, this is not the place to do it. If you wish to accuse anyone of wrongdoing or incompetence, these are the rules established by Bang the Table for the um, taking input on the comp plan. So the comments in question, the first co time a comment was submitted, this person named a staff member by name. The second time they also they removed the staff person's name, but um, uh, was deleted by the moderator for the response sought to potentially identify users or members of staff. Please depersonalize this for reposting. So each time a comment is put on the site, and I don't think there are many, if, they're, if they violate the moderation policy, the commenter is um, notified and asked to modify the comments to meet the, the policy. Um, we, and, and that's up then to the user to choose to do that. We do, um, they do keep all the comments that are not posted and we have access to those. So we do see, we can see the comments, they just won't be publicly listed on the site. The city of Urbana does not moderate this site. We have heard, we've hired Bang the Table to do it. And again, the point of the site is to get input on our comprehensive plan. And there are other options and ways to complain about particular city policies or um, uh, incidents. So just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. All right, um, Phyllis, I'd like to make a comment. Do I have to pass the chair? since this is just comment portion? Well, you're entering debate. So if that's what you're doing, yes. But just to make a comment, you don't have to. Okay, all right, I'm just making a comment. I just wanted to address some of the concerns tonight about um, public input. Um, so just to let everybody know, uh, City of Champaign asks for City of Residence. I have never muted anybody for failure to provide their City of Residence, nor have I asked them again if they choose not to do so. Um, but it does seem like there is some confusion in terms of whether or not it's required or not. So in the future, at the beginning of public input, I will clearly state that this is optional. You will not be at, you will be asked at the beginning, but you do not have to answer. You do not have to give any reason for not answering. Um, so I just kind of wanted to address that specific item. Uh, the second item that came up in public input was the fact that I was being investigated for um, violation of Open Meetings Act. And I just wanted to clarify that a little bit. There was a complaint filed in terms of the election commission board in which um, we responded by providing some additional information. So it was a complaint process. Um, you can call it an investigation or you can or you cannot call it an investigation, but I did wanna clarify what that was about. So those are my comments. All right, um, I think that- Grace a had a question. Uh, but, okay, Grace. All right, comment. <laughs> uh, yes, not a question. This was my original council input. Um, my hands oh, just... I'm sorry. Yeah, is this the appropriate time for that? This is the appropriate time, yes. Um, has there been a timer going or I can time myself? We're doing four minutes. I can, I have one, just wondering. I think you... it's three minutes and we have not been putting the timer up. I'll time myself and try and be on it. Um, just wanted to say that I'm honored and humbled to be a part of this new city council and I appreciate the information and support so far. I'm looking forward to serving with, um, serving the people of Urbana on this council with the new members, the staff and others in the city and community. Um, one thing I do really want to mention is community gun violence and um, attention and money and resources towards that with healing and prevention involving things like youth and community support and investment um, when we get particularly some of the um, new COVID money coming in. When I hear millions of dollars for a road, I would just love for those millions of dollars to go towards something like programs that directly help those who are most impacted by these things in our community. Um, also looking forward to addressing housing, discrimination, emergency response, and police accountability. 
Um, and just for the public, I'd say please continue to speak, keep uh, speaking up in public input and contacting us. Um, I'll volunteer myself. Please contact me about anything. We have our new emails. Mine's gwilkin at urbanaillinois.us. Um, and then last point about the asking about residency, um, just in, I'll add on to my comment. I think that we don't need to ask. Um, I don't see why we would ask just because Champaign does, um, especially if we're not requiring or even heavily pressuring that people a um, answer the question. Um, I think it would make more sense to be clear and consistent and just not ask if we don't need it. And that's all, thank you. All right, I think most people have had an opportunity to provide comment. Um, so that is the last item on our agenda. And with that, Wait, I will- name's Quisenberry. Oh. <laughs> just put See, uh, so Jayla, this is what we need. We need multiple people keeping a hand on, on the- uh, I, I just here. heard up and you're gonna have to use, get used to me going last because I'm ward seven. I did wanna ask though, um, is our process always to vote in um, ward order for every vote? Is that the, the practice? It has been. Well, because it, it's really advantageous if you're in Ward 7 to get to see what everyone else is doing. I'm just mentioning that because when I was on county board, they actually rotated who they started the roll call with uh, across meetings so that one person wasn't always the last one. I do want to say that I, I'm, I'm really excited about being involved in local government. Again, I enjoyed my time on the county board. Uh, this seems like an excellent team to work together with. I'm already, um, for Ward 7, I'm already uh, connecting with uh, the SUNA Steering Committee to hear from them about their concerns. And I know there are events coming up with uh, the Silverwood neighborhood uh, in early June. Uh, so there's some a lot of opportunities to get engaged. Um, it is important to um, remember, and, I, and I'm going to hold myself to this that, you know, although I'm elected by Ward 7 and I, they, they are um, where I get my voice from as a, as a ward representative, I represent all of Urbana. And so um, I hope you aren't concerned if I ask questions about things that are centered in your wards like I did with uh, the development in um, Ward 6 tonight. Um, I'm, I'm gonna be very engaged and I'm gonna ask a lot of questions. And if you are, are um, wondering why I'm asking those questions, I will be always well, willing to tell you, don't, don't presume that I'm asking questions on a particular agenda or going towards a particular item. I think we make our best decisions when we turn over all the rocks and, and ask all the questions that occur to us. Not all of them provide uh, the answer to the, the question, but um, I, I hope you join me in that kind of inquiry and, and we have a good time for the next four years working together. Thanks. All right, stop me. <laughs> okay, all right. With this, our meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much. Welcome everyone.